Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is Hal Herring, the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast and blast. Hey, I'm recording an introduction to this this episode today. Um, it's It may feel as if it dropped a little out of the clear blue sky down in the Bears Ears National Monument of San Juan County, Utah, and in a way, perhaps it did. For the uh, last couple of years, I've been working on a uh, movie about pub- American public lands, mostly in the West. And that movie's called Public Trust. It was released in Missoula on February 17th of 2020. And uh, during the course of helping with that movie, I was an interviewer and kind of a talking head. And I I, uh, I was I met some extraordinary people in some extraordinary places from the Arctic through to New Mexico, up into San Juan County, Utah, all through Montana, Idaho. It's just it was it was an epic uh, sort of adventure. And um, amongst those folks that I met was Angelo Baca. His father was a Hopi. Uh, his mother is a Navajo. They both speak Navajo. Angelo is kind of a, an extraordinary, well, I don't know how you'd say it. He, he's a filmmaker. Um, he's, he's a writer. He's working on his PhD in, at uh, New York University right now. Um, but he's very much from the Blanding, Utah country where his people have been for thousands and thousands of years. And, um, he was instrumental in working on the, the, uh, the coalition of five tribes, Hopi, Zuni, Navajo, Pueblo, and Mountain Ute, uh, which came together to advocate for and to help draw up a management plan for the Bears Ears National Monument, uh, which President Obama established, of course. Um, and and which of course President Trump has rescinded uh, from one point three million acres, I believe three one point three five million acres, uh, a reduction of about eighty five percent. Really, it was just a an attack on the the monument and the whole idea of the Antiquities Act of nineteen oh six, which under which the monument was designated. Um, as we know, these are this is, these are ongoing struggles of our time. The Bears Ears was a particularly uh, interesting, and, and let's just say that there's hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites within the Bears Ears, um, some of which had been subjected to a lot of looting and a lot of just, just pillaging and, and disre- disregard and attack, actually, over the past hundred years. And that's the reason the monument was declared in the first place. It, the Antiquities Act is only invoked by a president to protect a landscape or, or, a, or a historical building or a battlefield or whatever that Congress has simply, for whatever reason of its own, refused to act upon. Um, and a president can then use the Antiquities Act of 1906, which was written by John F. Lacey, a battle-scarred veteran of the Civil War, the five-term senator from Iowa, um, a man of pretty impeccable credentials for recognizing things that are swept away in the course of time. So Angelo and I recorded this as part of our film, and um, this is recorded in Cone Wash uh, or in, in, a, in a recessed canyon on Cone Ridge in front of one of the thousands upon thousands of enormous and, and to me, utterly incomprehensible pictograph uh, panels, they call them, but that doesn't do them justice. It's the history of thousands upon thousands of years of visions and daily life of people moving from the San Juan River north into these canyons at some other climatic epoch, perhaps, of life and dreams. Um, with that, I'll turn it loose. Um, there's some interesting ground that we cover here. I listened to this podcast last night, months after it was recorded, and I hope you'll stay with it. There'll be something for everybody in there. Um, it may not be immediately, but uh, thank you for being here. You know, in indigenous cultures, story is central to identity yeah. and to your origin, where you belong, who you are. So many of these different stories represent the... Uh, the centrality of indigenous existence. No one expended energy and time like this back then because you couldn't. Right. As a hunter, you know. You bet. You don't mess around. Yep. You only have so much daylight. You only have so much calories. You only have so much calories. You only have so much water. It's like somebody put that up for a reason. Right. And you may never get to know the reason. You might have to be okay with that. (laughs) 
<laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> but it's a story and it's important and that's why it's up there. Yeah. You'll go into the room and you'll just feel the energy of negativity from these people mm -hmm. when all you want to do is talk to them and have a productive dialogue that's both intellectual and productive and positive, mm -hmm. but they are willing to back a position that has almost nothing else to back it. Well, I, that's, going, that's very common in the United States right <laughs> it's now. It's very common, I mean. yeah. <laughs> sharing a space and a time for a moment or whatever it right. was um, it's what I love about Bears Ears is that it actually is timeless it's the collapsing of the past the present and the future it's all in one it's fascinating to me it's like one of those places where it, it can't be touched by the outside world because it's inherently not the outside world so we're here in uh, in the Bears Ears National Monument, or what's left? What's it, is this even the Bears Ears National Monument anymore? This is uh, this is right on the edge of it being cut. So okay. all that stuff out there towards the river, it's it's it's, it's out. under threat. Yeah, and that's the San Juan River. Yep. And I'm here with Angelo Baca, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna mispronounce this, maybe not, but you work with Dene Bacaya? Uh Utah Dene Bacaya. Okay. And what do y'all do? Uh, we actually are an indigenous-led nonprofit that is formerly a conservation organization, but we actually do all of our work on the community level. Mm -hmm. So we work with the elders, the community, uh, the traditional folks, and we do our work in land protection from a traditional indigenous perspective. Okay. And what kind of protection? Uh, like anything that requires our attention that we have many issues about. Um, the most pertinent one being the threat of bears ears being reduced and, um, and destroyed uh, by many different factors. But of course, things like water, uranium contamination, right. um, oil, coal, potash, uh, vanadium, uh, anything that really impacts our day-to-day -day lived realities as uh, indigenous people in this area. Gotcha. And um, how, how long have you been doing that? Um, it's funny. Um, I feel like I've been doing that my whole life, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, it doesn't feel like a job. It just feels like I'm finally allowed to be me. Uh -huh. um, everything else, everywhere else, every education system, every job I've ever had is trying to make me be something I'm not. Now I actually get to think and work and be and live as an indigenous person doing my work the way it should be doing. Wow. Well. And where are you originally from? I'm from here. I'm from uh, San Juan County. I uh, grew up um, all over from this area, from uh, Anis, Montezuma Creek. Um, spent some time in Monument Valley. Um, went to school in, in Blanding. Um, and I was all over the reservation. My family was, you know, um, in the health field. Mm -hmm. So they were required in many different places. Uh -huh. um, but I was lucky enough to actually get taught all of the traditional values and the importance of the uh, spiritual nature of the Bears Ears area by my grandparents who were traditional Navajo folks. And they didn't speak any English. Mm -hmm. They're very traditional. And they uh, practically raised me because mm -hmm. um, my, my mother was a single mother. And so I got to stay at home a lot and listen to them and learn the teachings and understand my language and culture uh, on a whole nother level, which I, I very much appreciate now. Well, wow. You know, my education has been at a tribal college first at, in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started running uh, collegiately there. Um, and I really wanted to run um, seriously in college, you know, to try to be very competitive. What, what did you run? Oh, I ran distance. Uh -huh. I did the 5K, 10K, steeplechase, uh, half marathon, and the marathon. Wow. So I have three All-Americans, two national championships, one school record, um, and then went to the University of Washington, ran for that team as well, um, and then got accepted into graduate school in 2004, but then I asked my committee if I could defer to train for the Olympic trials, mm -hmm. which I did. Mm -hmm. uh, they were happy to do that, which was a surprise to me. Yeah. Um, and I got really close to my goal. Uh, I trained with all Native American training team um, to Where do distance. Where was that? Uh, they're based in New Mexico. Gotcha. Um, Sports Warriors Track Club. I've and, never heard of that. Yeah. You know, our debut was in 04. Gotcha. I think it was 04 or 05. 04. 
And uh, it was the first time we ever came on the national scene. We got fourth place as a team. We beat major teams like Puma, Reebok, mm -hmm. like Asics. Uh, I think the only guys that beat us was like Nike and some other big one, Adidas. Wow. And, Where did y'all yeah, run that? Uh, that was in Portland. Uh -huh. Yeah, we ran that um, um, at the horse track, actually. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it was wild. fantastic. Yeah. It was incredible just to be there w with all of my my teammates from all the different tribes. Yeah. And that was another example of intertribal solidarity because we had everyone there, Navajo, Hopi, um, you know, Salish, Kootenai, Apache, like it, the list went on and on. It was incredible. Yeah. And so for me, I've always been close to working with my uh, indigenous communities, working with my tribal folks. I've been very much, um, you know, tied to like the embodied knowledge of being on the land. Mm -hmm. I've always gone hiking and hunting and camping and um, running. And running's like my biggest connection. Um, now that I live and work here, I actually go um, deliberately to somewhere else I've never been before in Bears Ears. Mm -hmm. And I'll run it on foot just mm -hmm. to see it, just cool. to see what it's like to check it out, to look around, pay attention, make sure everything's okay. Yeah. You know, I just check in. I check in with my relatives. I check in with the landscape. I check in with um, me, you know, try right. to figure out what's going on in my heart, in my mind, in my body. Yeah. And um, it's been a blessing. It's the thing that has carried me so far mm -hmm. um, because I grew up running here and training here. It made me strong mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I could go out in the world and be who I was and never be broken. And I still, I'm still that way. And I'm still an advocate for my people. I'm still an advocate for my landscape. And I had to go out into the world to be able to learn what it takes to do a series of changes so that we could advance forward in a good way mm -hmm. and then bring that knowledge back mm -hmm. here. And where, where did you go and where do you study? Um, I got my master's degree um, after that year of training to the University of Washington again and got my master's in communications and American Indian studies. And then uh, I taught for a few years at uh, tribal colleges and universities and then um, finally went to the East Coast teaching at Brown University. And um, they wanted me to actually come and work for them but I didn't have my PhD, mm -hmm. so Where I had to Brown? go. That's over in Rhode Island. It's part gotcha. of the Ivy League colleges, and they actually gave me a lot of freedom to teach from my indigenous perspective, mm -hmm. which I appreciated mm -hmm. because some colleges don't do that. Sure. And, of course, um, I pursued my PhD to uh, uh, where I'm presently at for um, anthropology and um, culture and media documentary film. So my you film that are I did. A filmmaker. Yeah. yeah, my yeah. film that I did was about Bears Ears. Gotcha. So that short. What's it called and where could we find it? It's called Shashjat Bears Ears. Um, uh, I have a film website online um, by the same name, and it's really um, about to be considered for distribution. It's still in like film festival production. It's going to be uh, showing in the chile film festival i think in june mm. so that will probably be its last release it's been showing all over the world like uh -huh. brazil um guatemala did, did you travel with it at all or did you did were you too busy back here i've been so busy here yeah. um i've been meaning to go and just like go to these places and you know take the message with me um when i can i do mm -hmm. like um uh, at uh the uh, cinema, Native Cinema Showcase in New Mexico at Santa Fe uh, Indian Art Market. We did that this last time um, in coordination with the National Museum of the American Indian. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. Like a lot of people were receptive. They enjoyed it. It was a full house. Um, and I, I learned that New Mexico is also very much passionate about protecting their public lands too. Right. So, of course, they were very much in support of Bears Ears. You bet. And you were you were in New York for some time? Yeah, I lived there for about three or four years, and uh, now I'm back home for my research, and hopefully I'll ultimately finish next year to write up my dissertation. And what did you, can I ask you what your dissertation is? 
Uh, the focus is mostly about like media uh, productions and narratives um, about Bears Ears. Yeah. So we're kind of examining what it looks like from within the community to each other as different uh, tribal communities in the intertribal coalition. And then ultimately what narratives are circulating outside of those circles in the world. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different stories from the outside looking in. Yeah. But there are also ones from inside looking out. Gotcha. And do you speak fluent Navajo? Um, I don't speak as fluently as I'd like to. Um, <clears throat> I was more fluent with my grandmother mm -hmm. uh, because I do believe that um, today there's constant pressure, especially as like a, an academic or a scholar researcher, to speak uh, very um accurate and precise terminology in more of a Western thinking way. Mm -hmm. And so like the more you do that, the more difficult it is actually to speak Navajo right. sure, because sure. you kind of have to like, you have to go back and forth and mm -hmm. transfer different things into mm -hmm. through different filters all the time. Right. It's pretty exhausting. I so, bet. Yeah. <laughs> Are the two languages entirely different? Like, like when you, when you think in one, is it, do you then have to convert it over? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that really frustrates me about um, people who don't understand Navajo mm -hmm. is like even in the perception of our leaders, just mm -hmm. like the county commissioners, they are doing precisely that. They are transferring Navajo thought into English, but it's very difficult to do and do it accurately because you're actually losing um, a, quite a bit of accuracy from Navajo to English. Mm -hmm. so English is actually a terrible language. <laughs> it's not accurate at all. Uh -huh. You can say one thing and you could mean like five different things. Mm -hmm. So it's very frustrating, um, even coming from like some weird hybrid of, you know, Latin, French, you know, uh, whatever it is. It's just Germanic language. It's all about like us being very specific in the Navajo language. Mm -hmm. And you can get like right down to the pinpoint about something mm -hmm. because everything's alive, everything's in motion and everything can be described. Mm -hmm. So if there's not a name for it, we describe it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, um, like the tire of a car. Like there wasn't any tires back in the day. Okay. So how do you describe something like that? Well, on the bottom of the car, just like on the bottom of our feet, of our shoes is like this rubber piece that connects with the land. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's basically like a shoe. So what you're saying is, you know, the, the car, like chitty, like that, its feet or its shoes is what's underneath it. So it's mm -hmm. like, uh, it's, it's kit. So a chitty kit is like, it's, it's shoes. So if uh -huh. it's like, um, you know, your shoes, you know, it's like, that's his shoes. And so you're saying like, it's basically the shoes, the shoes of the car. Yeah. And so people understand that. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. Gotcha. Oh, yeah, this is a rubber surface. It connects to everything. It's underneath it. it like, you know, it connect, it's, it's with the land. And, and so you can get super pinpoint accurate like that, mm -hmm. but you can't do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to, like, say what those concepts are because they, they are so um, ingrained into us that you can only really accurately describe it in Navajo, the philosophy, the right. religious parts of it, the ceremonial, ceremonial pieces. And that's very difficult to say. Um, for instance, Bears Ears, we don't like to say that Bears Ears is a sacred place, even though people can identify with that okay. because it's still from a, a Western religious framing. Right. So even like, who was it like Trump said recently something about whatever was sacred to him. And we're like, what? He just totally ruined that now. Cause like, right, you know, right, it's right. like, <laughs> yeah. so, so we'll have to come up with a new vocabulary and we do, we have our yeah. own vocabulary. Right. And that's the thing is like, if we use that thought process with that language, it's not accurate enough. Mm -hmm. So we all have to come from our own perspective and our own language to describe what that means to us. Mm -hmm. And we do, we all, and we are developing it in each of our own tribal communities from the Five Tribe Coalition about the importance of Bears Ears. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's the future for, for um, are y'all, are, are there lawsuits filed? Or is there, what's gonna happen with this, with the reduction? You know, uh, we are kind of waiting with uh, bated breath to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But 
honestly, I actually am very much positively in favor for the long discussions that are required mm -hmm. until the decisions are made uh -huh. because, you know, it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. Okay. And it's forcing us to face some very hard truths about ourselves. And we need to actually have these discussions, um, painful as they might be, about historical trauma, about injustice, about racism, discrimination, and what sort of factors are being placed all around us that we're, we're not seeing the whole picture about. Um, and even in discussions today, like in the San Juan County Commission meeting, you know, the guy who was talking about racism was framing it in such a way that it was almost like a victimhood narrative. Mm -hmm. Like they're saying this about us. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're that, but you know, and then continued to do his own thing. And it's a total non-recognition of a lived reality that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about all the hard work in between. I actually think, you know, um, that there's no reason to be afraid of whether it's a favorable determination by the courts. Um, because like I said before, it doesn't matter. We're still going to be here. We're still coming back. Right. We'll st we're still going right. to hunt, gather, right. you know, do our prayers and our ceremonies and visit our relatives. And there's nothing going to stop us doing that. Mm -hmm. This is our home. Mm -hmm. And, and when, uh, to think about hunting a little bit, I know it's hard to get tags in here, right? Oh, yeah. For elk. And uh, do the the tribes have in in Montana? There's there's arrangements for that, and then there's a huge controversy over tribal hunting in Wyoming right now called the Herrera case. Yeah, but um, have you followed that at all? No, but it's, I know what you're hot. talking about. It's uh, hot. Yeah, uh, I've heard also certain you know uh, controversial things about hunting practices even in the state of utah as well i'll bet like the governor's trophy hunt oh man <laughs> I mean, you probably know something well, we, about we that we could get into a whole other yeah. topic on that for sure yeah and well, auction tags and the private and, and the commercialization of things absolutely um, but uh do do, do y'all hunt the bears ears country i do in fact i grew up hunting with my uncles here mm -hmm. and uh we would go out there we were old school like we used bow and arrow uh-huh uh my my grandfather was well, super old school. He actually, he would go and get the deer for ceremonies. And to, in order to do that, you can't pierce the hide. Uh -huh. So you can't actually shoot it or, or um, otherwise, you know, run your, your arrow through it. You, okay. you got you to gotta get it by hand. Uh -huh. So my grandfather would run down sh deer on foot. Wow. Um, because you can't pierce the hide. And that is something that's, it's very rarely practiced these days. I was going to say that's a lost art. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a <laughs> maybe tough not one. lost, but yeah. Wow. Um, and I do feel like that's part of my genetic memory too, because um, I mean I still run mm -hmm. and I'm still doing what my grandfather and what my my relatives and my ancestors did. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we grew up hunting in this area, and you know, I remember my uncles and I would go out and we'd be out to the mountains and we'd be out to bear's ears and we'd be out deep in the woods and just understanding like what it means to be human out there right and where's the water yeah yeah exactly just that's what i out. keep thinking about when i cross then yeah. I, I go long distance in here i'm always i've got one eye out like because just because I'm, I'm not used to the desert like that yeah. you know yeah but yeah so um do you are you able to get tags and hunt well, I mean, I don't know how it works here. I'm speaking from a position of total ignorance. It's getting tougher to get tags. Yeah. It's getting more competitive and uh, less availability. Um, but there is something worked out with the Utah chapters, the mm -hmm. Navajo chapters, mm -hmm. where like a certain amount of tags are available uh, for a certain amount of like um, chapter members mm -hmm. who are tribal members. Gotcha. And so that goes out quick too. Mm -hmm. And you have to be just right on top of it if that's something that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's getting a little bit tougher these days to actually do what even I used to do as a kid. Uh -huh. Um, and I, I, I feel like that's kind of something we need to start reestablishing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, if we're going to talk about hunting, we should do it from a traditional mindset mm -hmm. and we'll start doing the practices again, like the preparation, the cleansing, the, um, the songs and the prayers and all the things that go with it. Like there's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not just to go out and shoot something, right. you know? So there's, there's respect that has to be done beforehand. Mm -hmm. Do you hunt, you hunt with a bow now still? I, I do a lot actually. Um, um, some of 
the things that I love to do is, is practice, um, just shooting, uh, anything where it's like, you know, stationary or moving or, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, there's something about it where I, I love more than a rifle being able to just do like a 50 pound draw and just feel the release, you know, mm -hmm. um, my grandfather also made bow and arrows mm -hmm. and, um, I find myself starting to, to play around with that a little bit too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I can't wait till I actually like master something yeah. and it comes out really well. Right. Right. That world will take you over. Yeah. <laughs> I have friends that do that, that, that that's what they do all winter, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just, this country is so difficult and unforgiving. I think it, it, there's another spiritual aspect of that. Yeah. And I know all countries, like where I grew up in Alabama, they all have a, a, a definite tangible spirit of its own, right? Sure. But this one is so, um, it's so, it's not adversarial. I don't feel that way at all. Yeah. But difficult, demanding. Absolutely. And then also given, like when you yeah. drop down in these canyons and you see this, like this yeah. verdant life, you yeah. know? So I, I guess that's what makes people who they are, right? Sure. You know, when I look at these pictographs, there's also, the pictographs have always been, I, I tell you, when I was in Oregon Mountains, they are so incomprehensible to me, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's the gulf between, <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, I just, I, I, when we see like the wolf man with the hands, uh -huh. and then just, just, it's just an amazing, totally, somebody saw the world in some totally different way. Right. Which I find um, actually optimistic. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, and it also begs the question, is it just one world, you know? Correct. Because we have all these stories of all these different worlds. Yep. Um, whether they were coming through and coming to a new one or they were sharing a space and a time for a moment or whatever it right. was. Um, it's what I love about Bears Ears is that it actually is timeless. It's the collapsing of the past, the present, and the future. It's all in one. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we talk about that, it's literally what it is. There's no separation for us. Mm -hmm. like, there's no difference between way back then and right now. Mm -hmm. And then the only unknown is because we as human beings have this limited perception of the future. But really, there's not any difference between that either. Because we are the ones who are a flash in the pan, right? right. We just have this kind of like temporary body. And then all of a sudden we're going back to the earth. But what supersedes that is like our relatives or our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. Right. They're going to might be standing here in the future, which isn't that far away. Well, we invented time, I, I right. would say. Yeah. You know, time, I mean, the place existed before us, before there was con our concept of time. Absolutely. So it's all this like world folding in on itself. It's just, it's fascinating to me. It's like one of those places where it can't be touched by the outside world because it's inherently not the outside world. Wow, that's great, man. I love that. I was um I, when I when I look at these pictographs, that thing where you said where dimensions meet or whatever. Yeah. Um that was one of my first thoughts in Oregon Mountains. Yeah. Was it something was like these these figures uh -huh. do not exist in the world as I know it. Yeah. At all. But people don't don't spend all this time working on this artwork. Right. To just to, to do nonsense. That's for damn sure. I keep telling people that. I keep yeah. saying no one expended energy and time like this back then because you couldn't. Right. As a hunter, you know. You bet. You don't mess around. Yep. You only have you so much so daylight. You only have so much calories. You only have so much calories. You only have so much right. water. It's like somebody put that up for a reason. Right. And you may never get to know the reason. You might have to be okay with that. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> but it's a story and it's important and that's why it's up there. Yeah. Well, this has always been a place where people sought visions, I think. Even even amongst the Anglos, right? It's just a place where people went to the austerity and sought, sought to learn something that they didn't know before. Hey, everybody, this is Hal Herring, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. If you are not already a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, this is a great chance to sign up, join up, and uh, be part of something powerful, um, standing together and having a good time, celebrating America's public lands and working to protect our future hunting and fishing there. Please go to uh, backcountryhunters.org forward slash BHA podcast, and you'll see there there's a, you get a $25 value t-shirt, the whole thing's 35 bucks, so you get a shirt. 
And for 10 bucks, you're part of the, one of the most powerful conservation movements in the United States. Uh, that comes with Backcountry Journal, which is a really great magazine. And it comes with part of being a movement that we're going to need more than ever in this future that's coming up in the wake of this pandemic and all of this government spending with these deficits. People are going to be, they're, they're going to be cutting funding for public lands. They're going to be going after public lands. We're going to need to stand tall and stand united. And this is the best way to do it right now. Pick up a membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and uh, we'll see you out there, man. One of the more impressive places I've ever really found myself. Um, it's right, it's the end of April, towards the uh, middle of April. So it's everything is kind of benevolent and green and beautiful. Um, so, Angelo, I was, uh, and you don't have to talk about this site. I know we don't. We don't want to pinpoint it. We don't. We don't want to get too deep into all that. But it's just like, did did you? Would you tell us why you brought brought me to this place? Well, you know, to be honest, I was a little bit anxious to bring you here, just because I know it's still kind of like a very important place that mm-hmm. uh, uh, our our own people visit. But you know, in terms of thinking about how to approach the land with respect and understand that there was generations before you here taking care of this place and it meant something to them and their lives were spent in these areas. Um, it means a lot for me to really give you an opportunity to see that, to experience it and to know it because I could talk about it all day long, but unless you're here and right. you actually see for, for yourself, sure. it's a totally different thing, as you know. Right. It was like you said with Zinke earlier, the only thing we got left out of the monument is a party you actually saw. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what, that's what that meeting is, yeah. is the, is the human being to the place that has whatever the spirit is, the, the energy, the uh, relationship to Mother Earth, that connection. Uh, however, it manifests itself to you is how meaningful it becomes mm-hmm. in that moment and then forever thereafter. Right. And for some people who have never been, all it takes is for them to have that small experience. Right. And, you know, Bears Ears is filled like thousands upon thousands of, um, you know, materials and ancient sites and beautiful rock art and picto- pictographs and, you know, all these amazing stories that are literally our, you know, um, kind of library of Congress, if you will, on the wall. Yep. It's like all the stuff, the history, the encyclopedic compilation of our existence in these lands is right there. Right. And to even comprehend that they're not having any extended protections like other things would right. is, is kind of offensive. Like and, the Sistine Chapel or something. Yeah. yeah. Or, uh, you know, anything in the... Some of those places that have been deemed, um, you know, heritage national treasures or Mm -hmm. uh, living jewels of, you Mm -hmm. know, culture and heritage. And I think it should be afforded the same respect and equality in that way that, you know, um, using that indigenous lens that we are still going to be in this place. We're still going to, you know... um, be uh, meaningful guardians and um, renew our relationship to these areas uh, with each generation. Well, when we pass that granary and, and those, and I, um, yeah. I know the Mary that we talked with yesterday, she said, well, I don't call them ruins. Um, exactly. You know, and I, I love that idea because yeah. I've never thought about that before. Yeah. But we pass that granary and the, and the remains of all the, those those settlements in, in those overhangs. Right. And um, do you think those people, <laughs> I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but do you think those people would pass this panel like every day on their way to the to the river? It's and, high possibility. And, and this is their, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to, uh, for one thing, when the, the artist is so, perfectly rendered yeah and it's so hallucinatory as well <laughs> um and the when i think of people going about their daily lives through this this ancient like like series of art so these are these are considered families you know mm-hmm. family members relations um and i think the one that uh this is named after that really petroglyph right there that little rock art piece is the wolfman panel which one right there where you see the hands yeah with, with the 
the call? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that man, that guy. I got you. I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we're we're talking about this from a Euro American Western view, right? Sure. Them naming it Wolf Man Panel. Right. Probably have no idea what this place really is. Yeah. Which is fine for me. Yeah. Right. Um, Because even if they did, but they know what I'm talking about, probably not. Right. Well, it's across time and language and yeah and psychology and what do you um. I was going to ask you, and you were saying earlier that, um, well, first, do these did these panels? Does anybody know, like, at, like, like, what peoples were were doing this? Who who did this art? Well, as I was saying before, I believe that it has been a collection of different groups at different times over hundreds of years. Oh, it was just like About, thousands yeah. of years. Yeah, um, just over in Sand Island area. Um, not too far from here, that's it's probably like the first or second oldest petroglyphs or rock arts mm-hmm. in North America. Gotcha, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're talking like uh, like at the end of the Ice Age. Like gotcha. 11, Is that where the, the strange beasts are that are, have been extinct? Yeah. 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 Hey, did you get a chance to see that? No, but I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. What, what, what were they? Was it like, is it step bison or? What's on there? Yeah, it's like an extinct um, uh, form of uh, like woolly rhinoceros and mammoth Whoa. and buffalo and yeah. things that used to live in Roman this area that yeah. were either moved off of, uh, you know, in a migration pattern or climate change or being hunted off. Yeah. So there are lots and lots of different phases of change in this area. Yeah. And you can tell by the lightness of the the images on the rock. Okay. Those are the more recent ones. Gotcha. And the stuff that's the darker, kind of really faded ones, that's that's what's been here for like across time with yeah. wind and sun and yeah. rain and just being stained into the rock. Sure. So they've been here a little longer. But that's I love it. incredible. I love it because to me, um, it's a totally different way of telling the story. Yeah. And, you know, in indigenous cultures, Story is central to identity yeah. and to your origin, where you belong, who you are. So many of these different stories represent the uh, the centrality of indigenous existence. You know, some of these are representations of clans, mm-hmm. like who they are and where they come from, um, <clears throat> what mattered to them um, at that time in that place, um, images of different, you know, spirits or you know, um, you know, ancestors or tribes that came through. And I really love the fact that uh, it's so vast and different that there's like thousands of these yeah. all over Bears Ears. Yeah. And we couldn't ever really know all of it. Right. And there are some people who are trying to do it, like archaeologists and anthropologists and all these people, but, you know, they're just barely scratching the surface. Yeah. They really don't know anything. Yeah. So it's kind of... Um, it's conjecture on most of their parts sure. to s- sort of like feel like they know exactly what it means. Right. Well, it's in the same way that it's conjecture is how long people have been here too. They keep revising that every time. I mean, I'm, I've, I've been around five decades. Exactly. It's changed like 10 times. Exactly. <laughs> it gets older and older every time. They keep saying like, oh, uh, it's like 10,000 years ago, like then not, 11, yeah. then 12. and. Right. And now it's like, what is it, around 15? Yeah, they're maybe. It, stuff? It's, they're pushing it hard. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that to me signals like you no matter what your um your hard line science is, it's still able to be changed um because you know our indigenous uh identity was tied with story and history and uh with science yeah it is is really quite advanced and the rest of like western science and knowledge is really kind of catching up to it yeah so yeah i find that fascinating it's even like some of these kind of like spiral calendars those are the ones that are like they're still accurate to this day right it's an incredible figure um not not just a man figure but that that circle with the the starburst inside it yeah yeah and then over here is like it almost looks like it's you know um, kind of like from the south to me, mm-hmm. like representations mm-hmm. from Central America. Sure. Yeah. So, and it's not impossible because this whole area has been frequented and traveled as like a. Well, uh, that river exchange. corridor feels like yep. it's been traveled from from the dawn of time. You know, for sure. 
I'm gonna, and somebody, of course, had to sit up over there and put the bullet holes in. Of course. I, was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can imagine those early pioneers. Or how, how old do you think that is? Like 50 years, 100 years? Well, was, some, somebody had a rifle that they were like going, watch me hit that figure, man. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's probably a little bit more recent than that. Because yeah. Those, those are some deep holes. They are. And was, if you look across the way, you actually do have to position yourself with right. quite a bit of effort on top of that area to look straight down. And, so and take like, that shot. That's some real hate. Yeah, you know, it is. Yeah, motivating sure. somebody. Yep. Um, and that's, It's so pretty. Yeah, they're so cool looking too. Oh yeah. I just, um, what, um, Angelo, you were telling me you're, you're, I wanted to go back to this. Um, you're, you're half Hopi and half Navajo. That's right. And so you're bridging two cultures yourself or two, right. two distinct um, identities. Sure. Would is that would that be true? I mean, is that accurate? Um, I don't know. I'm asking. I feel like they are both definitely distinctly different. Yeah. But I don't think they are um, foreign to each other because we do share the same land. Mm -hmm. So, um, I always like to point to the example of the name of Bears Ears, because with all the different tribal groups, mm -hmm. even though they had different languages, right? Like. Udo Aztecan or Dene Athabascan or the Zuni, which is a language isolate. Nobody speaks their language. Zuni is just Zuni. Uh -huh. They're the only ones that speak that. Okay. And they still came up with bear's ears as bear's ears uh -huh. within name. Interesting. So independently, they all developed a relationship to the land that revealed itself as really the spirit of the bear. Gotcha. And the bear is a relative. The bear is like a, a medicine person, basically. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about a bear, they really, they eat everything. They're omnivorous. Sure. So they'll eat plants, they'll eat insects, animals, right. anything. So they know what's best to eat. They right. know what helps you, what heals you, what you shouldn't have. Right. Um, and they stand up like people and yep. they kind of move around like they people. play like people. Yeah. yeah. So for us, it's like, that's our, that's our close relative. Gotcha. And... It just made sense that, you know, they had that connection too because they're in this land. Mm -hmm. So when you go all the way back to the root, you're not that different if you are from the land. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is where a lot of disconnect happens between indigenous folks and other non-native Anglo people. It's like they still knew here. They just got here. Mm -hmm. And they don't really have like a a, a working beneficial connection sure. or a partnership with the landscape yet right barry, Lope, barry lopez wrote a lot about that at one time i was, I was yeah. I, I, that that idea he really articulated that mm -hmm. idea well yeah i mean i'm they're working on it but it takes a little while and right. i do feel like um it's it's part of uh making those connections with every generation is the the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, you know, the, the earth that you're touching. Like, right. And then just having all those generations that you're putting to rest in the ground. And then they're giving you back everything else, all this life, all this greenery, all this beauty and medicine that's around. Like that is the love of your ancestors wanting you to be healthy and happy. Mm -hmm. They're providing for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a continual relationship that the land is helping to support too. So for me, I, I just, I'm amazed at how much uh, disrespect and just animosity is being produced at this moment mm -hmm. because they, I think, they are cognizant they don't have that connection. Mm -hmm. So they're fiercely trying to grab onto anything mm -hmm. that they have, mm -hmm. um, even if that means and damage. What you, sure. I mean, part of the, what do you think they're fiercely grabbing onto? Like I, I asked... Um, County Commission today. Um, I said, like, really, like, we've got all these federal lands, you've got this enormous recreation economy that we're, we're, we're kind of like wading through yeah. every day, you know. And I was like, you're, you're in kind of like, you're deep in God's pocket here. Like, why the conflict? Like, why this, why this animosity and the, and the anger that, of the comments that mm -hmm. were at the, at the County Commission meeting? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure he had an answer for that. He, he's a smart guy. He did, a, he did a good job talking with uh -huh. me but do you i mean we were talking about this a little bit earlier what what do you what is the basis of the seeking of the conflict right i yeah. mean i mean and, and there is legacy of conquest yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah mean, maybe that's it right but i don't yeah. but it, it's 
it's another it's another time for for them now where it seems so things are so good mm-hmm. for for the say the Anglo inhabitants of San Juan County. Mm-hmm. I know they may, may say they're under, there's less employment or what, but it's a wonderful place to live. Sure. Why does why is the anger? Uh, I just don't think um, you know people once they get into a comfortable position of power and privilege, they want to give that up or share it. Right. And that's just human nature. Sure. Um, especially with like Mormon communities of Utah, displaced communities displace other communities. Right. So violence that was done upon them as they like were in seen, Missouri and, and Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, sure. I, it's it's easy for them to perpetuate on other people as well. Right. Um, but I, you know, for me, I feel like that's where the line ends personally because they've also co-opted and appropriated our identities as indigenous people within their gospel. Mm-hmm. Basically saying that dark-skinned native people, a.k.a. Lamanites, Lamanites, were the ones that committed genocide upon white-skinned Nephite people first. Right. Therefore, on a subconscious level, it's easy and, and justified to enact the same violence upon us. Gotcha. So all that kind of thinking slips into every realm of life, including politics and law. Sure. And I don't want to like simplify and bring it down or nothing, but like uh, the, some of the myths there are are quite preposterous. And I, I, I'm, I myself keep waiting for a religion that has revelations for people of things that they don't want to already do. Yeah. Like, (laughs) like, like visit violence upon other people who happen to have stuff they want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, like, I'm just, I always thought the base of religion was kind of like discipline and, and commandments that you didn't really want to follow, but that would, would make you a better person. Right. Sure. But so many of these kind of revelations, like take over the wildlife refuge or do X, Y, or Z are things that, that they kind of already wanted to do. Right. Um, and I, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, so I, I give a little bit less credibility, you know, to, to the revelations that I, you know, like I have a revelation that I should smoke a cigarette and eat Fritos, you know, <laughs> but, but well, that's, that's, that's taking something out of, out of this, mm-hmm. this place or this trip and mm-hmm. making it silly. It's not silly, mm-hmm. you know? Well, I mean, uh, for me, uh, it's, it's not silly at all. In fact, it's one of the, the few topics we're not tackling that we should be. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're going to go down deep and we're going to be upset about things that are legitimate things to be upset about, maybe we should have this relig- religious discussion about mm-hmm. the impact of that on our people in this area because mm-hmm. it's a real lived reality. Right. We face discrimination and racism and violence, and yet it's seen as justified to these people, mm-hmm. not just on a economic or like a political level, but on an ideological, philosophical, religious level, Mm -hmm. they are willing to perpetuate violence and have done it in the state of Utah upon our communities Mm -hmm. for how many hundreds of years, for decades, right? Right. And so you have all these examples that support that, you know, the Black Hawk War, the Meadows, Mountain Meadows Massacre, the Bear River Massacre, um, the the Posey Wars, like uh, the Long Walk. There are a myriad of reasons why my people have anxiety of speaking up. Right. Because 1923 was not long ago, and they're perfectly willing to take out their concealed weapons and shoot us in the street where we stand because they did it once before. Mm-hmm. Dee, what's the, um, and I'll ask you the same question I asked Bruce Adams, was um, what's the future like? What does it look like for you? Like, like good or, you know, um, optimistic or negative, whichever. Because obviously there is a huge amount of time here, the time that has outlasted all of our conflicts and, and every, every interpersonal struggle. It's, it's probably the biggest thing that gives me hope is because, you know, I look at our ancestral sites and our rock art and all of our, our technology, agriculture, history, science, math, medicine, and we were so advanced and we still have that knowledge that we are patient people and we understand that this is going to pass and it's this generation that has held on to what is almost so futile to hang on to because change is coming so quickly mm-hmm. that we take the long view and we're just waiting for the younger generation to take it forward, mm-hmm. which appears to be the case because, you know, our, our children uh, from these five tribes of Bears Ears, 
feel so passionately about protecting this place that they're willing to run hundreds of miles on foot from their respective communities, right. from Colorado, from New Mexico, from Arizona, just to come here and pay their respects and do their prayers. Mm -hmm. And they become more connected because they have that uh, deep down, you know, DNA kind of connection that is reactivated when they're back on the landscape. And for me, I feel like if anybody understands what that connection is like, that um, they should respect it and honor that and then become a part of that conversation, which I feel like only young people are willing to do. Right. They're more inclusive. They're more um, uh, patient, there's kind, a There's a open. window there. Yeah. There's a window there. There's no doubt. Yeah. I think that's all. It's true of every in every culture and every generation. Right? It's true. Um, what, when you were talking about the five tribes earlier, you, you said one of the people, the gals working with y'all is, uh, um, is, is Pueblo. Uh huh. You're Hopi Navajo. The other tribes are on, in, involved in the Bears Ears thing or who? Right. Uh, so part of the five tribe coalition are the Hopi and the Zuni. Okay. The, officially, right? But the Pueblo peoples are all connected here. So there are villages from Santa Ana, Laguna, Hamas, um, Acoma, like they're all connected here and they can all tell you which place they belong to. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of incredible actually to see that young lady and her friends right. from her Pueblo come. This was, this was recently, uh, I would say last month. They had never been here and we took them to a site. And it was like they were on automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. Something just kicked in mm -hmm. and they knew exactly where to go. Wow. And they just didn't, they didn't doubt it. They just went with their feeling and they actually knew exactly how the place was mapped out. Wow. And it was just like the weirdest thing to, to watch them, to come to this realization is like, I know this place. I've been right. here. I understand it. I recognize it. And then just having that, um, that reconnection and, and witnessing that was incredible. Uh, and it was probably, you know, after so many hundreds of years, the most uh, increased number of like actual folks from these areas coming back to mm -hmm. visit it. Mm -hmm. And it was like the village was alive again. There were a lot of people right. from their own place coming back to see it again. Wow. It was just like, wow, this is what it's like because they were speaking in their own language. Mm -hmm. It was some of the oldest dialects mm -hmm. ever known to man. And it was echoing off the walls. Wow, that's they were a singing the songs. Story. Yeah. They were like, and things were coming out, man. It was alive. Like people started just like saying uh, prayers and singing songs. And it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Yeah. Back home. Yeah. They were home. Right. I was, the, this is maybe an irrelevant anecdote, but years ago, many years ago, I did a story about the reintroduction of the condors. Oh yeah. And they raised these condors from hatch eggs. And when they turned them loose in the Grand Canyon area, um, they flew around for like a day and they landed in the nest that had been occupied by birds that they weren't, they had no, maybe they had DNA c connection to, but there was no way they would have ever right. had any experience of that whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 and I know people, I know people are, have the same thing. Some of that's yeah. been lost. Mm-hmm. You know, and obliterated, not obliterated, but, but, but hidden underneath, you know, layers of sugar and television and, 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 <laughs> yeah. and warm clothes and, and lack of connection or lost connection. Sure. You know, but I, I know people were never, they're not any different. No, it's true. It's, I really believe that, uh, it doesn't take much to get back to that. Right. Uh, because we still all need the basic things to live, right? We need uh, water and air and earth and sunshine and, you know, uh, interaction. And, and like it's when you don't have that stuff and things are really scarce, you become hyper aware of it. It's almost like you smell the water before you see the water. Right. Right. Yep. Because you're so thirsty. Sure. And that's kind of where we're at right now is like we're so inundated with other things that we we become our own obstacle to our connections. Right. And... And yet this the thirst is, is there. The thirst is yeah. there. In fact, it's driving you mad and crazy because you're surrounded by water and not a drop to drink. Yep. And, you know, for us, it's like this is where we come back to replenish. Yep. This is where we come back to drink that spiritual water that gives us life again. 
yeah. you know it's why it's so important is because it's like an anchoring point to the core of who we are even when we forget it which is easy to do anyone can do that today sure and you come back here and you're like I remember what it's like to be hot, to be mm -hmm. uncomfortable, mm -hmm. to look for water, to be in the shade, just like my ancestors did. Right. And now I'm human again and I'm on the same level. I'm not better than anyone else. I'm not bigger than anyone else. In fact, I'm even lower than some of what my other counterparts would have me believe. Like I'm, I'm just the same as these plants and these animals. And, right. you know, and that's what our teachings tell us is that human beings are the five-fingered people. Dineh be eshklai. Eshkla is five, and Dineh means the people. So that's how we identify as human beings. But there are other people. There's other Dineh. There's like the insects and the birds and four-legged and, you know, and there, what's the difference? They're people too. They have their own language. They have their own culture. They have their own environment. Only difference between us and them is this. We can mm -hmm. do things with this, mm -hmm. you know? And so... It's looking at the world with a different set of eyes in terms of equality, justice. And that's the reframing we need to do. And go back to the beginning and understand that we're all on the same level. Right. I think that, um, and I, I, I've talked a lot about this over the years, but um, I, people say, oh, well, you know, you've been an environmental journalist for 20 years or something, aren't you depressed, you know? And um, one of the things that I've, I've come to believe as, as a revelation is that the we carry that right there yeah. forward into a future yeah. that is is where people will actually embrace that knowledge that's already in them yeah. of the lack of separate yep. the lack of separation from the rest of of the of creation mm -hmm. and and I think that future is really bright yeah. right and there may not be as many of us right. you know it may it may look totally different and it yeah. may take you know whatever however long I don't know yeah. I don't think it has to be a apocalyptic I think it has to be a movement <laughs> into a and I, but I think it will be a move, movement into a future right. where we get that yeah yeah right. I I absolutely agree with you I think that right now it's like we've We've been so like held down and struggled for so long. It's like until like the last moment, um, we'll be we'll be released and let go, and then we can actually take a full breath. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we have this weight on us. Where we're like, oh, this is all just too much. But you know what? It's, the answer is not as hard as you think. Like, you're surrounded by relatives these plants, these medicines, the animals, even our own ancestors who are, who are buried here, like they, they thought of you um, hoping that you would have a good future. And I feel like that's, that's really what, you know, our indigenous people wanted was for us to do well. Um, and, and it's not excluding other newcomers, they knew you guys were coming. Like mm -hmm. it was prophesied, mm -hmm. it was in stories, it was in visions and mm -hmm. dreams. And what I love is in every one of those narratives, they never once differentiated it. And you can look at that like in Black Elk Speaks and some yep. of the things we're talking about, all the colors of the will and sure. that our children would have children with their children. And so there was no discrimination in that narrative. No one was excluded. Everyone was included. It's actually a native tradition to adopt if you need family if you need a brother or a sister if you need some help we'll take you in right. and that's part of you know the the antithesis of where we're at in this world today it's not about power it's not about greed right. it's about sharing but you have to move you have to move through uh, maybe you have to move through that bardo or whatever they would call it you know and, yeah. uh did you uh you know the idle no more movement yep yeah. um there was an, an elder in bc and they were doing a pipeline protest, and he said, um, he said for decades, um, they told us what what was good that our that our that our knowledge that we had wasn't valuable, and that they had the guns and the wheels and the motors and all the stuff. And and he said, and, and we 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 adopted that, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, and now and and he said now, some of us have kept this older knowledge, and this is what we have to offer them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was one of the most profound things I've, because I, I it rang true immediately. Sure. Right. It yeah. was like, it was just, it was just, it was a piece of profundity. Yeah. <laughs> that I saw on Link TV or something one night, right. you know? <laughs> no, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've just, I've had the, the revelation 
You know, it's like <laughs> we are so uh, we are so advanced in our own way that um, everything else is kind of just taking the long way around right. and and catching up to it. And it's sort of the same idea about like um, you know with the uh, study on on sweetgrass. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, a lot of tribes, especially in the plains and northern areas, they use that. Sure. And they found that you have to actually interact with it a lot, and then it helps the sweet grass to come back and regenerate even stronger and better than before. Mm -hmm. But if you fail to do that and you don't interact with the, the, the medicine, then the medicine goes away. Mm -hmm. And so... The plant actually, is still there. It's still there. I got it's you. Just, it's just not... Um, you know, it's just not um, the same kind of like flourishing and thriving um, as it was when you had that relationship with it. That's because incredible. Because you needed yep. it and it needed you. Yep. And then you just had like this mutual beneficial kind of, right. you know, symbiotic relationship happening. So when you, okay, so we're, when, when we're at these pictographs and we're in these canyons, this is something that the Bears Ears National Monument itself was to me a step forward. It was like a step forward in recognizing a landscape scale, mm -hmm. not just culture, but spiritual and, and just, just plain old landscape. Right. Um, and, and, a, and the honor in a, a, a vast place. Mm -hmm. And how did y'all, obviously the native people that you, you are mm -hmm. and work with are, supported the monument. Right. And okay, so yeah. what, tell me about that. What did, what did y'all think? Did, how long has that gone on? Why did y'all support it? You know, um, there are a lot of reasons why to support a monument, but I think for us, we really have always f seen this landscape as, um, you know, it's, it's holy, it's, it's spiritual, it's sacred, it's whatever Western term you want to think of it. But even in our language, when we talk about it, it is kind of the, the central part of our identity um, is the story of this land. And so it's hard to express it across a different culture, a different language, a different mindset. And so we often get um, frustrated because we can't really communicate it that well and, and it feels like no one's understanding us. Right. But what we found was when we were communicating it to all the tribes and the communities around Bears Ears who had claim to it, they knew immediately because they already had the established relationship of that land to them. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really matter what our differences were. We all knew the central part of it and why it was important to protect. And that translated across everything. Mm -hmm. and everybody just understood it. And, you know, the, the next step was, well, how will we proceed in interacting with each other? And so one of those major steps forward was when folks from our Navajo community in this area, um, after so many years of animosity between the Pueblo or Hopi folks with us and some of the other tribes who don't normally get along with the Navajo, you know, they came to a meeting and uh, uh, the Navajo elders were like, welcome home, mm -hmm. you come back. And that was like, whoa, like all the Pueblos like, they did not expect that. They were kind of taken aback by it. And they, they thought about it for a while. And they thought, well, that was the first time that's ever happened. Right. And if we can continue to speak to each other that way, uh, like relatives that are welcoming each other back to their home, um, then we can actually move forward with this. And, you know, I was taken aback when I first came because I was like in the middle of that sort of movement forward. And I had come back from school and... Uh, I attended one of these meetings, attending to, to film it and photograph it as well. And I just couldn't believe how many different kinds of like tribes were sitting in the room together mm -hmm. and not fighting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, wow, nobody's arguing right now. This is weird. Yeah. Um, because there's always something that somebody will bring up or they know another family member or right. they're disgruntled about something old or new. And uh, there wasn't that. It wasn't that feeling in the room. It was a feeling of and, reverence and, and respect. At this meeting, y'all were talking about the, the pros and cons of the monument, or yeah, the, what yeah. to support. Yeah. They were talking about, uh, they were talking about um, how to um, get the things that we wanted the most out of the monument. Mm -hmm. uh, because the monument means that there wouldn't be any more further 
dangerous uh, natural resource extraction. Right. There wouldn't be um, development happening. Uh, there wouldn't be uh, looting. Or, right. It would, archaeology would be more protected. It would be definitely heightened to a level where um, if anybody was suspicious before, um, then they were on the radar. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think before it was just kind of accepted common practice around here. Yeah. But we really kicked you it mean up like a notch. Pot and what? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. right. Um, uh, there's a lot of damage done to the sites and, you know, things taken. And even from when I was a kid and I came out to some of these places, they look more uh, deteriorated now. Yeah. And looted. Yeah. Yeah. When, um, so I, I think on a, on a larger scale, like I didn't know anything about the, that record or the, the coming together of, of mm -hmm. the different tribes to support this. But, um, I do think I, I saw this and then, and, and of course I got proved a monkey again, but I saw this also as a, as a healing process between, um, the Anglos and, and the native and the tribes. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw, I thought we were making, now we were making progress in a good faith effort mm -hmm. to do something that we both really wanted and that, and that we could be guided by the, the wisdom and the knowledge that you were talking about earlier. Sure. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And then, and so I mean, I mean, I, I, I had been writing about this and I interviewed hunters that hunted the monument and that were supported it. And uh, the one thing that really took me aback was when they just shrunk that away. Mm -hmm. It was as if you had this thing in your hands mm -hmm. and it slips through like mercury or somebody slaps it out of your hands. Mm -hmm. And I, did y'all feel that way? I mean, I mean, what did you feel like when they when the when the shrinking began, the great shrinking? Um, I think we all expected it. Mm -hmm. I mean, name me a president in the history of America that was actually good to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are levels, right, where it's like, well, they did that thing, but, you know. Right. Um, so it's really kind of a low bar yeah. that they still don't clear. <laughs> yeah, I hear And you. Uh, we don't have that high of expectations, you know. Right. Um, but it does feel like again, taking the long view, that it really doesn't matter if they squabble over different lines of definition, right. whether it's a monument or, you know, a wilderness area or whatever that they want to call it, it still bears ears for us. Mm -hmm. And it's still home and we're still coming back mm -hmm. and we'll still be here. Like, mm -hmm. this is home. We're not going anywhere. I think this is where people don't get that part is... Mm -hmm they feel like we're extinct and that we've gone away and who are we to come back and say that this is ours mm -hmm. because we've always been here. We're still here and we're always going to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're not, we're not leaving. Mm -hmm. This is right. home. Right. And so I think the more they start to come to realize and grapple with that fact, the easier it will be for them to actually accept that what we're asking for is really of the highest um, request for them to show up and be the best human beings that they can be mm -hmm. because that's where we're going back to is all the way back to the beginning, the beginning of the country, the beginning of contact, the beginning of human beings on the landscape, like literally. Mm -hmm. And so to go all the way back to do that and to do things right is a lot to ask of these people who have already invested so much in going in the wrong direction. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> what about this site itself? Yeah, uh, like the yeah. Uh, fact that it was um, <clears throat> the Obama monument had it protected and now no longer. Gotcha. And clearly yeah. it's an antiquity. Or yeah. If that's the right word. Under the antiquities of that. I think in this area in particular, I think, um, you know, like land and ownership and property uh, plays a great role in the thinking and mindset of reduction. Um, I think those folks who advocated for that and ultimately signed off on it were the ones who don't come down here and see this for the amazing uh, beauty and, and, you know, awesome history that it has. Yeah. I think they are only focused and invested in that particular mindset. Um, What's in there we can get out. Yeah. 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 I mean, or how can I maximize my profit and get my return back? Um, cause this doesn't seem like it matters to me, you know? Right. Sure. Um, but it's kind of funny, you know, we, we sort of joke around like the places that were in, uh, 
the president's uh, reduced unit area yeah. is where Zinke actually got out and walked and looked around and he was like, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. <laughs> so we call it the, the Where Zinke Walked Monument. <laughs> so it's like yeah. in Trump's smaller units. Yeah, yeah um, you got you. So uh, yeah, so it's kind of, it's like, well, you know what? You might have changed your mind if you actually got out of the little chopper there and right. walked around on the landscape and taken a look at these places and actually right. figured out, like, you know, um, your way doesn't necessarily mean the best way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been doing this kind of back and forth for so long that um, it's difficult to get people on the same page and feel like they're making progress, like you said, and then, then suddenly yank that out from underneath Yeah, it them. definitely felt like a yank. Yeah. And, and... And one of the things I know um, that when when the the two Navajo men were elected to the county commission, I asked the commissioner today if if the conflict over Bears Ears had precipitated that, mm -hmm. you know, like like then escalated the um, the tensions, mm -hmm. which then resulted in the county commission having two Navajo commissioners for the first time, right? Right. Do you, is that true? Um. Well, I always tell people that, you know, Bears Ears is, is not the controversy. The controversy is what existed before that, which is the gerrymandering, uh, the racism, discrimination, the exclusion of Native people in all these areas of life that these people enjoy in mm -hmm. their positions of power and privilege and comfort. And so now just the mere idea and the, the possibility of that either going away or having to be shared uh, makes them, you know, completely... Uh, I don't know how else to describe it except, you know, um, uh, illogical and and borderline, you know, crazy because mm -hmm. it's it's just it feels like a sickness. Mm -hmm. Like you'll go into the room and you'll just feel the energy of negativity from these people mm -hmm. when all you want to do is talk to them and have productive dialogue that's both intellectual and productive and positive. Mm -hmm. But they they are willing to back a position that has almost nothing else to back it. Mm -hmm. So well, I, that's going, that's very common in the United States. Right it's now. very common. I mean, yeah. I mean, this yeah. is more, this is more of like a, an ugly, yeah. like a manifestation of that you can hold in your hand. Like yeah. I saw, I saw some of the comments today that were like, like yeah. aggressive and negative, negatively yeah. aggressive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I, I mean, I, it's 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 definitely more in your face. Yeah. But like, it's everywhere in our culture at the moment, in, sure. in the United States. Sure. Of of fact free. Yeah. And and like intensely angry. Yeah. Hard held opinions mm -hmm. based on not much not fear much. fear maybe. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. And I and I just wanted it to be. I wanted it to be different. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I yeah. saw this 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 effort. And um, you can love Obama, dislike Obama. It doesn't make mm -hmm. a difference. I saw this effort as a recognition that we could move forward. Yes. Positively on a, and, and for, for nature, for yep. ecosystem services, yep. for tribal uh, identities and, and, and um, old wounds right. that we could shake hands over. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. and then it was yanked. Yeah. I mean, that... Well. With the benefit of uh, hindsight from native, native communities all over the place, you know, it it kind of unofficially fell to us to be like, oh, it's okay. We've had bad presidents before. It's like, yeah, this isn't the first right. and probably not the last right. genocidal attempt on our people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we have lived through the apocalypse. We are survivors. Right. And we're still recovering. And here it is. You know, it's like, you know, we went through so many iterations and people, it's funny to me, people are fascinated with these stories today sure. um, in the movies, on TV. And they're like, oh man, the end of the world, the apocalypse. Like, right. you know, we went through that, right? right? You know, we're still recovering from this. Mm -hmm. Like this is, a, this is our life. This mm -hmm. is the world that we're living in. Right. And it feels like when these people don't listen to us or they're not taking us seriously, then they are less than human. Mm -hmm. And maybe they are the walking dead. I don't mm -hmm. know. Right. <laughs> we we're the, still the ones who are trying to stay alive in this. Right. And we're trying to shake the patient to wake them up. It would be nice to give everyone the cure. Right. Yep. Well, I think of it too is the, is the, you know, the Greek myth of Cassandra who was cursed with the ability to predict the future absolutely perfectly every time and then cursed with nobody ever believed a word she said. 
That's <laughs> awful. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that was that was her curse, right? Yeah. That was the double the double whammy. <laughs> yeah. um, well, Angela, I want to say thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure how this podcast will run, how what we're gonna do, how whether it, because we have no continuity, we just wandered around. <laughs> but I do that a lot. Yeah. So um so to Angelo Baca, thank, thank you, you so yeah, much, you, sir. sir. Yeah, it was great. Hey, this has been uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. I'm Hal Herring. We're signing off for this one, but we'll be back in a week or 10 days. In the meantime, uh, check out backcountryhunters.org. Get some more podcasts there and see what we're up to. And uh, also, I'm, I'm going to be out there wandering around hunting and fishing, wearing out a pair of boots. And I uh, hope you'll be doing the same thing. We're living in God's pocket. We need to celebrate that. Never forget it. And get out there and and live it and enjoy it. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Talk soon.